glad to have you guys with us online as well as those who are in the building. To those of you uh, who are in the building, um, we normally have a little roll-in video for our live audience. So I'm going to get off the stage, do that, come back, and then we'll move right into our joint uh, session. So just wonderful to uh, be here, happy to be here. And so let me get off the stage so they can do that. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Josh Howell. I'm the pastor at City Hope Fellowship, and uh, we're so glad to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and parents, if you, uh, we, we brought some coloring stuff for kids in the back, so they're in the back there on that table if you need any. I think there's a bunch back there still, but I'm going to pray for us uh, as we get started this morning. So let me pray. Father, thank you for today. This is the day that you have made, yes, God. Lord, and we will declare your goodness. God, thank you for this service and the dream that we've had to have this for several years now and finally getting able to do it, God. And would you do a mighty work here this morning? Yes, that it wouldn't just be uh, a, a performative picture thing, but a real transformation of our hearts, that we'd be transformed here this morning by your spirit and propelled into action and life together to showcase your goodness to this community. Jesus, you said that the world will know that you were sent by the Father because of the way we love one another and because of the way we are one. So God, would we display that oneness here today and not just today, but every day. And Jesus, would you be honored in it, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen. So we have a few pre-planned uh, pre and prepared things, but we're kind of going to go as the Spirit leads. But you guys don't mind that, do you? All right. So I'll have them put the first uh, question up, and uh, our brother Mitchell is going to read. Can you explain how you two met each other? So I'm going to let him start that because I don't remember. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were joking actually beforehand because I this morning I was like, what was the first email I sent Andre? And I was trying to find it and I couldn't find it. So we're going to kind of spitball it here. <laughs> uh, but I remember, uh, so we launched City Hope Fellowship in 2017, so we're, we're about to turn five years old as a church, uh, and so in the pre-launch uh, uh, portion of this, we were really trusting God, as, as we'll talk about here in a little bit about our vision, uh, trusting God to, to start a multi-ethnic, uh, multicultural church uh, in downtown, and so we were like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to, like, <laughs> learn from people. And so just tried to meet with as many people as possible because it was like, hey, I don't think that we are showing up downtown to, like, do something new that God isn't already at work doing, right? Like, God was already at work. And so it was like, oh, there are people that have been doing this for years. Uh, let's get together and talk through it. And so just reaching out to a ton of different folks, and you responded, and we got coffee at Starbucks, Starbucks I think. Starbucks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Starbucks. And it was like one of those moments, I think we've both said this, where it was like we walked in, started talking, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is going to work. Yeah. Like, this is a friendship. This is like we have shared vision for how God's working in the world, and it was like very clear right from the get-go, like, this is going to be fun. Yeah, and I know it doesn't look like it, but he's several years younger than me. You know? <laughs> wait, wait, is that a shot at me? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think so. <laughs> That's all right. That's Home all right. court advantage. You're on my turf. <laughs> no, That's but, right. But it's, it's, it's weird in the sense that I do a lot, and in my mind, I'm a behind-the-scenes type of person. But my name gets tossed around to other people, and people will say, hey, I heard about you. And I'm like, is that good or bad? <laughs> you know, I I'm not sure. So when, when we met, and I met with him, and uh, we'll get into this later, but 
but let me be very candid and honest. I've had a lot of white pastors want to meet with me, and I love it. I love, I love, I love that. No problem with that. But after some of the meetings, I felt like a token. Like, I'm meeting with you to check this off my box or to say, hey, I know this black pastor. But when I met with him, it felt like a friendship. It felt like a fellowship Amen. that gave me hope yeah. for the city. Yeah. You know? So. <laughs> yeah, I, you'll have to help us. I'm not for sure what's next. So just, just flash our, our next question up. Can each of you tell us what your favorite scripture is and why? All right, I think I'm. I think I go first on this one, and for me, I have several favorite scriptures, several favorite uh, passages. One of the things I love to do is read through the Bible in uh, every year, and uh, I, I don't read through the Bible to be super spiritual. I read through the Bible because there's so much I miss and there's so much I need need to gain. But when I became a pastor, it is these two verses that really jumped out to me because I really realized I don't know what I'm doing. So it's these verses. Let's, I'll read the first one. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. The next verse in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So as an individual, I have several favorite scriptures, but as a pastor, that is my life verse because I don't know how to lead the people of God. Solomon said the people of God are great people. Now, I believe he was speaking actually numerically, but I see it that every person who names the name of Christ is a great people. And I'm just a regular old human. And without God's leading and guiding, I won't be able to lead anyone. So I trust in him and I acknowledge him in all my ways. I don't always make the right decision, but if I always acknowledge him, he's promised that he would direct my paths. And if my paths are right, the people who are following me, their paths are going to be right. So for me, that verse, those two verses really jump out to me. That's good. That's good. Um, well, City Hope folks know this, but literally every Sunday I'm like, well, this passage is like one of my favorite passages. So uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to pick. Uh, but I would say uh, in this season, uh, both personally and as a pastor, I would go to uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, verses 15 and, uh, through 17. Uh, for the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over, and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion, don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness, with his love. He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Amen. Amen. And so I, I, th I think for me... Um, I would say the, the majority of my job as a pastor is convincing Christians that God actually loves them, like God actually loves you. Yeah. And we spent a great uh, time this morning worshiping God and singing to him, but the most songs that have been happening all morning long is actually the Lord singing over you. Wow. wow. And so that, that uh, experiencing that reality, that God actually sings over us is the thing that will transform us to actually be the people of God, be on mission. All the things that we want to do aren't going to happen apart from us really resting in God, delighting in us. Not just like, hey, I forgave you, and you can like hang out in the back, but like, no, come here near me because I really love you. So that's that's been huge for me. That's uh that's amazing. I'll take a quick little rabbit trails that my people are, I'm known for some rabbit trails. I like that. <laughs> but I will, I will say the, uh, the background that we grew up in, which was uh, charismatic Pentecostal, uh, very good for what, what it was, but in some ways it made you fear God. 
not so much that he delighted after you, like everything you did wrong, you were going to be kicked out of the kingdom. And so then as we grew and my, my father shifted our ministry toward grace and we learned a whole lot more about grace, but still the trappings of legalism was so hard to let go of. And so to hear someone say, especially a pastor say, God actually delights over you. That, that's, that's a revelation right there. And it's powerful. And I, and I will say to all of us, as we're living this Christian walk, we don't always get it right. But to know we have a God that actually cares for us, delights in us. And the fact that he died for us, and one scripture basically says, wouldn't he freely give you all things if he, if he, really, if he gave his life for you? So that, that's beautiful to me. So I might make that my favorite passage. All right, you, you can steal that. You can steal that. <laughs> okay. Can you explain each church's vision, mission to us? All right, I'm, a, I'm starting this, this one off. And uh, if you look around the room there, we have these, these words. And so I, I will go through them. Deliver simple. Let's do what we normally do. When you see them come up, repeat them after me. So let's, let's bring this. And we do this every uh, single Sunday. So the first thing is we love by living our vision every day. All right, and number one, we connect with our creator continually. Number two, we confess our deliverance consistently. Number three, we commit to serve creatively. And number four, we communicate Christ's love compassionately. So that is our vision, vision statement. Who Our motto is love, living our vision every day, but what are we supposed to live? And so it's broken out in these ways. It's very similar to uh, the Ten Commandments in the, that the first five deal with God and the last five deal with man. So it deals with both a vertical relationship and a horizontal. So our first stop is we have to connect with our creator continually. So that means we have to get out of just thinking it's a Sunday morning thing only. No, it's a continual constant. If, if he is your father and you love him, and there's a real relationship, there should be a continual connecting. And when we connect with our creator continually, one of the things that we see like uh, Isaiah saw when he was in the temple and he said, holy, holy, holy. But the next thing he said was, wow, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm an unclean person. And so the closer you get to God, the more you will see how, how frail you are as a human. So that leads us to our next thing. We confess our deliverance consistently. And we say the reason why people come to Deliverance Temple because they do not have it all together. Amen. Perfect temple is for perfect people. We are not perfect people. So we are Deliverance Temple because we consistently need deliverance. But we, act, we actually have to confess that, that where we are is not where we're going to end up. So we consistently confess that God is delivering us. Personally, uh, I feel like an onion. I feel like God has delivered me in layers. And when I thought that, oh, man, I'm ready to crack heaven's gates open, there's a whole other layer of things that God is delivering me from. But I'm always confessing that. But then that leads us to the next step is we commit to serve creatively. And what, what we mean by that is we call this a church service. But we've been trained to just come into the church, and this is our experience but the work is actually out there. So committing to serve creatively is like I'm not just worried about the four walls of the church. And if the pandemic didn't teach us anything, it taught us that church is not the building. Church is us and how we serve others. And, and another rabbit trail, I'll try not to be too long, but I was talking to another Christian uh, at, at work and he was just all up in arms about something. And I was just like, okay, what's going on? And he was like, I drove by a Presbyterian church in Indianapolis, and they had some sign about gay pride. And he was so freaked out about it. And I'm like, well, why can't we serve them too? Why, why, why can't we commit to serve creatively? You don't have to agree with everything, but we should be servants. And we're, we're so caught up in our silos, and it's all about my church. We forget that we're supposed to serve. And then that leads us to the final thing, which, which is all what we're trying to get to, is to communicate Christ's love compassionately. Christ was a man of compassion. 
First, he was a man of like passions, but he was a man moved with compassion. And so are you so locked into your doctrine and theology that when people meet you and bump into you, you don't show them love and compassion? And hopefully, by the time we get delivered, we can actually communicate Christ's love compassionately. So that's our vision at, here at Deliverance Temple. And City Hope, if you bump into any of my people and they're not living the vision, you can tell them on me. You can, you can tattletale. <laughs> All right. Well, at City Hope, um, at City Hope Fellowship, we seek, uh, we are seeking to be a diverse people saved by Jesus, centered on Jesus, and sent by Jesus to extend the hope and fellowship of God to our city. Uh, so we say this every week too, uh, right at the beginning, right? And what, what, what this means for us is a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, we, we believe the mission of the church is to bring together the global family of God. So uh, unity in Jesus and diversity across all divisions in the world. So that means embracing people as made in God's image uh, with their distinctive language, ethnicity, race, culture, place in life, all of it. Embracing who they are in that and uh, being unified in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, that is something that the world has tried to do a ton uh, and can't do. And that the church has tried to do a ton and can't do. And the, the church has actually messed up a ton. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that soon. But, but the, the reality is this is only possible because of the work of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so as we want to seek to be a diverse people, right? And, and we use that term pretty uh, intentionally, seeking to be a diverse people. We know we haven't arrived in any meaningful way, right? Like we are a work in progress and we never want to think that we have arrived when it comes to unity and diversity because then we, we tokenize people, like you were saying earlier. And, and it has to be this like, hey, we're honest about who we are, where we're at, and we're seeking the kingdom. But it has to be centered on Jesus. And so we have to be saved by Jesus. Like we believe that Jesus has done a mighty work. And so this hits right with your confessing deliverance, right? This is, we need to be saved by Jesus. We need to be saved from ourselves and our sin and our own agendas yeah. that we come into and saved from our own righteousness, mm -hmm. our own good works that, that don't meet God's standard. And so we need to be saved by Jesus. And then for this to work, we got to be centered on Jesus. Yeah. Like, if Jesus is in the center of everything we do, and particularly as we seek to be a diverse people, if we make diversity king, we lose Jesus and diversity. Mm -hmm. We need to make Jesus king and actually embrace one another in Christ. Yeah. And so Jesus has to be the center of everything we do. And then if we're saved by Jesus and centered on Jesus, then we can be sent by him to do his work in the city. Um, that we actually care deeply about the full city of Muncie. We love this place, and we want to serve. Uh, and so we want to be sent to extend the fellowship of God and the hope of God to a place that desperately needs the fellowship of God and the hope of God. And so we want to be about uh, being sent out from, yeah, like you were talking about, like this isn't just a Sunday morning thing. Uh, what it means to follow Jesus has to affect every day of my life. And so how are we sent out by Jesus to do these things? But particularly, we're sent by Jesus, meaning we don't get to make up what we're sent to do. Like, we have to actually obey what he tells us we have to do. Yeah. And so we've got to know the word. We've got to be uh, soaking in God's word and then sent out by the power of the Spirit. That's, that's awesome. Let's, can we clap for that? It's amazing. This may be putting you on the spot because we definitely didn't talk about this. I like that. Do you have any testimonies of since your city hope and you, that's that's been your missions of of bringing hope or mm. think? Do you have anything that you could just share with us mm. that, that maybe maybe your church knows but DT wouldn't know that mm. you could see the effect of that? That's good. That's good. Uh, all right. I'm trying to think off the top of my head here. Uh, you are putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I like it. I like it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've gotten to see some really, some folks in some really challenging spots come in, be loved by our church, and see them grow and not 
be a final product. Like, continue to struggle and continue to be loved by our church and continue to be a part of our church. And so one of the things that we talked about early on is we want to serve our community, but we want to do it not um, like if, if, if whatever we're doing to serve, right, if, if metaphorically, right, there's a table and we're giving something out. We'd rather not sit on this side and give something out across the table. We'd rather sit side by side at a meal. And so what we've tried to do is partner with other folks that are doing things really well in service and build relationship with folks in hard places. And so we've tried to figure out ways, uh, and, and Chris, who was up here, uh, Chris has all the great stories. Uh, Chris, who was up here singing worship, he's our uh, director of Mercy Ministry, and he gets to interact with so many folks. It, I, we often say we sort of have two congregations, a congregation that shows up on Sunday morning and then a congregation that we get to build relationship with and serve. And those are really hard. Like, I think some of the stories that, like some of the people that come to mind, it's like uh, I've learned this work is not always buttoned up in a story that you would write in a book. Mm -hmm. But if you are doing that, you might not actually be doing the work, right? Like doing the work is actually, oh, people are super messy. And we get hurt, they get hurt, and, and we repent and we walk through that together. And so some of those things have been this transformation of us as a people interacting with folks and seeing our lives change as we are doing ministry with other folks and welcoming them into our family. Uh, and, and seeing those things, seeing our families uh, kind of get transformed through some of those things. Now, some of my favorite things to do uh, over the course of the pandemic, actually, we had an outdoor uh, baptism and communion service you guys remember that? And in that one, it was really fun. We got to baptize a whole household. Um, and that was just a really special, sweet moment of seeing this family choose Jesus together and walking through that with them has been really sweet. So uh, to deliver something, doesn't that sound like our bishop, how he would go out into this he was the pastor of everybody. Not all of them came into the building, but he was. That was his heart, and so that's that's probably why you and I kind of connected so so much. All right, let's let's go to our, our next question because we're, we're going to spend a little time on this. It's a two part question, so you can read both one and two. Speaking of vision, how do you each see rad racial reconciliation as it relates to the church? Are there any scriptures near and dear to your heart on this subject? Pastor Josh is going to kind of camp here for a while, so I'll let you just. Yeah, and as I get going, if you want to jump in at any point, too, we can go back and forth. So, um, so this has been a huge part of what we have talked about as a church uh, since before we launched and kind of in preparation for those things. And So this is a, a thing that we've talked a lot about. As a church and thought a lot about. So racial reconciliation as it relates to the church, I think first uh, understanding, uh, I think it's important to understand that race is a social construct, right? There's only one human race. Uh, so race doesn't have any biological basis, but because of the heresy, and I would say heresy for sure, because the church had a role in this, but because of the heresy of white supremacy, we now live in a racialized world. And this racialized world exists in which we're divided along racial categories, dividing us on these sort of superimposed categories that were uh, created to, to divide and to oppress. This division has obscured God's creative genius because God has made each person in his image with our ethnic and cultural differences. So, but... but because of the way in which language works and language grows and changes, I think the term racial reconciliation, though race is a social construct and not a biological thing, is a helpful term in the sense that it's a, a, a category in which we understand and li live life in. Gotcha. And so when we refer to racial reconciliation in the church, I think we're, we're thinking along ethnic, cultural, and racial lines. Um, 
So I would say that racial reconciliation as it relates to the church is the mission of God to pursue unity and diversity through relationship and justice across racial lines by the blood-bought family of God. Right, that's a big, long sentence. So I'm gonna unpack each part of that, okay? Right, so uh, the mission of God to pursue unity and diversity through relationship and justice across racial lines by the blood-bought family of God. So, mission of God. This is God's idea. So, I I didn't uh, throw this scripture in, but uh, I'm going to read it real quick uh, because I thought about it later after we after we talk. So, uh, this is from Genesis to Revelation. This is God's mission. So, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, God calls Abram, right? And he says, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Now, that that word family, all the families of the earth, is is a word that translates into ethnos in the Greek, right? Into all races or ethnicities, right? All ethno-linguistic people groups. So when God calls Abraham at the very beginning of creating the nation of Israel, his mission is the global multi-ethnic family of God. From the very beginning. Like from day one, this was what God was doing. He's going to give Abraham this family. And we see it show up in Revelation. We see it show up at the end that there's every tribe, tongue, language, and nation gathered before the throne, right? And so this is Genesis to Revelation. This is God's idea that the church would be unified in this way. So uh, so that's the mission of God. And it's the mission of God pursuing unity and diversity, right? And so if we're to see racial reconciliation in the church, there has to be something that unifies. Again, it can't just simply be diversity. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that unifies us, and it's the person of Jesus. That Jesus is the great reconciler. He is the one who is doing a mighty work in bringing everyone together, and he is king and Lord, and so we can unify together around Jesus and the person of Jesus. But if we look to the person of Jesus as unity and use that as a way to obscure diversity or or overlook diversity, I think we're using that wrongly. Mm -hmm. That in Jesus, our diversity is actually exemplified and honored. It's not, uh, we're, we're not looking to create, uh, like I think sometimes racial reconciliation looks to create a sort of colorblind idea or existence. But that doesn't work because yeah. God made us the way we are and sees us the way we are. That's right. And, and that obscures Jesus who's born as a Middle Eastern Jew, right? Like, he maintained, he is embodied, and because of the incarnation, Jesus, God becoming flesh, he actually takes that flesh into the new heavens and new earth. So he's still going to look like a Middle Eastern Jew, first century Jew, right? And so if we obscure diversity for the sake of unity, we actually u- lose the unity that we're trying to get because yeah. we lose Jesus. Yeah. And we lose so much of what the New Testament is doing. And so it's unity in diversity, and our unity around Jesus exemplifies the unique ways in which God has made us. Um, Now, the way we accomplish this, I would say, is through relationship and justice. Uh, So first, relationship, being a part of the family of God together. Paul, often in the New Testament, right, uses the language of body. He describes the church as the body of Christ, And when he describes the body of Christ, some of those passages, he's describing various gifts. So he's like, some of you have this gift, some of you have this gift, but you all work together in the body. But in each one of those passages, he starts those sections with uh, some of you are Jews, some of you are Gentiles, some of you are men, some of you are women, right? And so the Jew-Gentile relationship that dominates the New Testament, and if you're unfamiliar with some of these things, right, Uh, the way in which the Bible works, there is the Jews, the people of God, and the Gentiles, everyone else. And Gentiles, there's all sorts of different categories of Gentiles, but those are the two people groups, and those are, that's a huge division, right? Like, it's big. And Jesus reconciles Jew and Gentile together. 
where you don't have to become culturally Jewish anymore to be in the kingdom of God. So if Jew and Gentile, that division is broken down for Gentiles and other Gentiles to separate from one another, it makes no sense. And so have to come in together to the family of God. And so when the body language is used, he says very clearly, like if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. Meaning, if one part of the global family of God is suffering, we have to suffer. That means there has to be very real relationship. Mm, wow. In which we are a family together. Which means we're going to disagree and not get along. Mm -hmm. I don't know how every other family works, but I'm pretty sure most families don't always get along, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it means we're family at the end of the day, so we're going to work through it. You can't just say, no, 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 I'm not going to work with you anymore. Yeah. We got to work through it. But here's the other piece of this. Justice is another way in which we work through this. If I see my brothers and sisters in Christ as my brothers and sisters in Christ, and they face injustice, I have to go seek to correct that injustice because you're my brother or my sister. And so relationship and justice have to be together. As Cornell West says, justice is what love looks like in public. So if we say love God and love neighbor and don't pursue justice, we're just saying we love neighbor. We're not actually loving neighbor, yeah, gotcha. right? So often when we talk about racial reconciliation, a lot of folks, pastors, mostly white pastors, will focus on the relationship across racial lines by minima, uh, and at the same time minimizing or straight up ignoring concerns of racial justice. That's not reconciliation. Or sometimes we have a focus on racial justice without the goal of relationship in the church. Remaining separate peoples of God without animosity or injustice. So we can, we can try to work for justice, but we actually want to stay separate from each other. Because mm -hmm. we're not sure we actually like each other. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But reconciliation can't actually be possible without relationship and justice. You can't say, hey, I want to have relationship with you but I don't care about the injustice you're experiencing. Let's get rid of, let's not worry about that. Yeah. Oh. That would be like a marriage in which there is unfaithfulness and you're like, hey, well, let's just forget about that. Even as it continues. Wait, wait, let's, let's just be together. I know that the unfaithfulness is continuing, but let's just be together. That doesn't work. No, it doesn't. That, that, that will not work. But that's the same as what we try to do often in the church is say, hey, let's all get together and let's all be family together, but not talk about like the big issues like, hey, there's a history here in which predominantly white churches have oppressed and done a lot of evil. Are we going to repent of that? Are we going to talk about it? Are we going to ignore it? Like, what are we going to do? And what about what's happening today? Like, are we going to deal with those issues? And so if we're to pursue racial reconciliation together, it has to be those things together. Can I? Can yeah, I yeah, just, jump in. Jump can in. I just interject? So, deliver something. You see why I like this guy? <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, but but here's the thing, right? At the end of this definition, whatever, on racial reconciliation, I said by the blood bought family of God. The means of pursuing this is the blood of Jesus. So Ephesians chapter 2, I think that's one of the scriptures I picked here. Um, I think yeah. it comes up. Uh, Ephesians 2, 14 through 18 says this, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Yeah. 
Now, here's the thing. So together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups by the means of his death on the cross. Our hostility toward each other was put to death. There's real historic hostility when we're talking about racial reconciliation across global ethnic lines for sure. But in this country, certainly across black, white lines, there is real, like actual hostility. How do we overcome that? Only by the blood of Jesus. It says our hostility toward each other was put to death. But what was put to death? Jesus was put to death. So this is why this is so crucial for the mission of the church. When we don't care about racial reconciliation, when, we're, when we ignore injustice and these things, what we say is, Jesus, I know your blood bought this thing, but I don't really care about it. Because Jesus' death is what brings this unity. And why the, global, why the early church exploded across the world is because no one knew what to do with it. Because they looked at the church and they were like, who are these people? These folks don't hang out together. Like this this group of people doesn't get together. Why are they together? Because the blood of Jesus has bought each other. And we can actually lay down our hostility, meaning we can repent, we can come, we can make mistakes. Because of the blood of Jesus. And then we can pursue justice together. By the means... That Jesus has articulated, meaning by nonviolent means. Like Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So we're gonna pursue injustice or justice in the face of injustice, but we're gonna do it by the fruit of the Spirit, by love, yeah. by unity, and by the blood of Jesus. That's powerful. I, I, I would like to, yeah, that's powerful. I would like to add when you talk about the church exploding, some people forget that we see it now, but it was a very patriarchal society, even much more. So the idea that women were more prominent in the New Testament than the ancient world understood. Like, what are you guys doing with, with these women? Why are, why, like, what we, what we take for granted, it was, it was so revolutionary to the ancient world, and they saw, saw these people coming together, like, across racial lines, gender lines, and ethnic lines, and all of that, it's amazing, and then to see so many years later us lose a lot of that steam. But if we put ourselves in the early church, I mean, it was amazing. And I believe that when God comes back for his church, it's going to be much more like the early church, like the early and the latter reign is going to be together. So, so we're moving towards something, but we've, we have so watered down Christianity, we've forgotten how revolutionary Jesus and his followers were. Amen. Amen. And, and to piggyback on that point, it looked crazy and looked like it wasn't going to work because it was so small. Mm-hmm. Like, I think when it comes to racial reconciliation, lots of folks, and particularly, um, like, I think particularly over the last few years, as conversations of racial justice have, have become uh, very prominent, a lot of pastors, and particularly white pastors, have sought to try to enter into this space and have done so in sort of a, hey, this is a trendy thing to talk about. But the reality is the way in which the early church worked, it was really small things that took years. This isn't like, we don't come up with a solution for racial reconciliation in like one meeting and be like, oh, good, we got that solved, that's good. We're in good shape now. No, no, it takes decades, generations. And that's how the early church worked. Jesus ascends into heaven and has 120 followers. We would look at that today and be like, well, that was a failure. Let's start over. But like, that was how it worked. And then it took years and years and years. And so one of the ways in which the, the church got sidetracked is as soon as the church aligned itself with the Roman Empire, it got sidetracked in pursuit of power, which is totally where we got, why we got to where we are about racial reconciliation anyway, is because the church, the predominantly white church, aligned itself with power in a different empire, one that we live in now, 
which is basically the same kind of empire, <laughs> and aligned itself with that power and then didn't want to let go of that power and oppress people in pursuit of power. And so if we align ourselves with the empire, like, we're never going to be able to do this. And if we're looking for a big splash to make something happen, it's never going to work. It's like small steps of relationship and justice. So you, you mean this joint service is not going to fix everything in Muncie? I don't think so. Okay. Just... But this is the catalyst, right? Stuff like this, because he, here's, the, here's the flip side. The world might look at this joint service and be like, that literally did nothing. Well, that's not what we believe. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is doing something. That's it. Yeah. It might look small now, but 10 years from now, 50 years from now, yeah. what does Muncie look like 50 years from now if we do this yeah. continually? Yeah. It reminds me in Genesis chapter 3, there was the fall of man and the mess up, and then God, in his cursing, he says something about a seed, a seed coming in. Way back in Genesis, it said that it would bruise uh, the heel, but you would crush his head. But that seed is what we worship today. Yeah. It took thousands of years for it to come, but the seed. And if we just plant something as small as a mustard seed, maybe this service is a mustard seed. Amen, amen. That our children's children could reap. So it's, it's about the heart of what we do, and it's, it's, it's about to say, that's, that's powerful. But. That's good, that's good. And, and even thinking generationally, right, in that for, for us as a predominantly white church, for me as a white pastor, it's, I got to think generationally in both directions to say, I'm connected to the folks in history who stood in my position and did great injustice. Mm-hmm. So I need to repent and be honest and reckon with the real history so that we don't repeat that and so that we remember we're working for, yeah, our children's children, that it looks different then. But God is just always slow. He's never quick. We just finished walking through the book of Exodus, and it took us a really long time because God is slow. (laughs) And me too. (laughs) And, but... The Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years. And then God sent them a baby. (laughs) And they were like, wait another 80. It's fine. It's good. And so it's like, but but the Israelites just didn't see what God sees. And you and I don't see what God sees. And so we got to be faithful today with what God calls us to today, trusting that he's doing what we're doing today for the sake of... 50 years from now. And then Peter comes along and says the slowness, I'm paraphrasing, the slowness that we think is slow, that God's not slack concerning his promise, but a day to God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So God's moving a lot faster than we know. We're just trapped in time, but we serve a God that is not trapped, and he's not controlled by time. So whenever he does it, it's right on time. Because he's not, he doesn't bow to time. But as we go and as we process through that, and we talked about, last week we talked about hills and valleys, how God is the God of both the hills and the valleys. Because our church, we've been in a valley season. A lot of death, a lot of loss, a lot of, we've just been in a season. But it's good to be faithful in those seasons because God is still at work even when we can't see it or feel it. He's still at work because he's never slow concerning his promise. When he does it, it's going to be right on time. Amen. 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 That's, that's awesome. One, one, one other thing to, to, to jump in. I don't see where we are at time. Um, you mentioned Genesis to Revelation. And you talked about Genesis 12 with Abraham. What I find so interesting about that is, for, so Genesis 1, we see that God is very global. Adam and Eve mess up, and then we get all the way to Noah, and but all, all that time, he's still working globally. And then at Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, and everybody gets dispersed. And then in 12, 
he, th- he talks about Abraham, and so he starts working with one people group, but he said, through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So he was still staying global. Yeah. It's just that everybody messed up so much. He's like, what I'm going to do, I'm going to hide it in one people group. And then I'm going to, from that people group, I'm going to use Jew and Gentile. But I, he was always global. But the Jews didn't see it because they thought he was only going to be the Messiah for them. Amen. And sometimes as Christians, we think God is only for us. Mm. But his, his, he's much bigger than yeah. just us. Amen. He's always had a global, much bigger thing. Amen. And then, right, bringing it full circle, we just, a couple weeks ago, was Pentecost, right? And on Pentecost... Holy Spirit descends on the church, and they speak in tongues, and what what happens there in that passage, right, is is less about the the gift of tongues and more about the way in which the church is being transformed, right? Mm -hmm. Because everyone there is like, wait a second, they're speaking my language, but they don't know my language. Yeah. Communicating, it's like a reverse Tower of Babel. That's what it was, yeah. And so it is, and, and this is the unique thing for the church, from the very beginning, right right before, what did the disciples ask for Jesus? They were like, okay, what, what do we do now? And he says, wait for power. What power comes? Languages? <laughs> Languages is what comes? Yeah. Because the mission is unique to go get all my global family. Yeah. That's the kind of power you need. Get the global family. And so the very power of God in the church is crossing these lines that the world makes up for us to be unified in Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so powerful, so good. Well, we, we've got to get, get moving, but let me, let me, add, one, let me add one thing. As, as black people, and our church is predominantly black, we've always uh, drawn other people because of the way we love, but we're predominantly black. But something for us to think of, since we are, are basically in America, and mainly in America, we've been the victims of much of uh, the racial oppression. But what keeps me from being too militant is when I look at Africa, there has been genocide in Africa from people who are dark skinned. So it's not a color thing, it's a human thing. It's It's a wicked thing. If you are human, you have the propensity to hate and be evil over the smallest slither of things. We fight over the dumbest things. So as, as black people, we can't think, well, I'm above being petty, because no, we all can be if we focus on our humanity, but we focus on our divinity, then we move in this more global, more reconciled way. So, so never think because of the color of your skin, well, I can never be that. You can be anything if God doesn't help you, and if God doesn't touch you. And on one other flip side, the Israelites were slaves of Egyptian masters, and Egyptian masters come from Africa. So it's not just the whites that were slave masters. Every color on the face of this earth have been slave masters, and every color on the face of this earth has sometime been the slave. Well, and I, I, I didn't get to it, but just real quick note. We're going to be here till like two or three, guys. Is that what we said? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> two third, yeah. uh, the uh, right, the Egyptians are the slave masters. But when Egypt is, or when Israel is delivered, there's this one little line. I, I think I don't know if I gave it's it to it's, you. Yeah, yeah, I had it in Exodus 12. Yeah, bring, bring up Exodus 12. I think 37 and 38. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That night, the people of Israel left Ramses and started for Succoth. There were about 600,000 men, plus all the women and children. A rabble of non-Israelites went with them, along with great flocks and herds of livestock. Rabble, that word there is, is in the Hebrew, it means a great number. So Egypt oppressed Israel, and when Israel was delivered, a whole bunch of Egyptians were like, yeah, you know, no, that's God. We're going with God. <laughs> and so as justice comes, reconciliation comes also. That Israel didn't say, no, 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 you were a part of the oppressors. You don't get to come. They let them come. And so Israel already is a multi-ethnic thing. And then they kind of lose sight of that. But Jesus brings this back. But, But it's this combination of justice and relationship that is huge. 
and as a part of those things, it kind of fit what you're saying. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, I think you have a, a revelation scripture that's very important. Will you go ahead and, and take us there too? Yeah, yeah. Uh, revelation 7, 9 through 10. So this is where we're going. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Yeah. So this is John's vision of the new heavens, new earth, and it is not like what oftentimes we think about heaven where we all become angels and float around. Yeah. Like, no, no, these are embodied people. He sees them, and they have different colors and languages because he sees them. Yeah. And yet they're all singing the same song. All singing the same song. The song of the redeemed. This is the place that we're going. And if you don't like that, we sh- you, you might want to check whether you want to be in the kingdom. Because <laughs> yeah. that's where we're going. That's where we're headed, yeah. So why do we not pursue that here? Yeah. We're content to be like, no, we're not going to, like, th- that's hard because we're different. We have different preferences. We have different things. Well, we, we better figure it out Yeah. because that's what's coming. And the whole point of Revelation is to say, you, church, bring some of that into the present. You're like a movie trailer for the movie. And Ooh, is, I like that. is our trailer, is it, does it really good, uh, like, is it good? Does it describe what heaven's going to be like? Not often. Right now, our treasure, this, it, our trailer shows that the treasure is America. Mm. We have a lot of preaching yeah. that's really American nationalism. Yeah. It's not really the gospel. But we need to have a trailer of the gospel. Yeah. I, that, that was just a side note, sorry. No, that's good. That's good. No, you got to bring that. Yeah. Well, well, I, I only had one, one scripture to, to add uh, to this, and, and mine is in Micah. And before I read it, I, I, I had a, uh, a, I was going to say a young man, but he's in his 60s. And we, we ran into each other through Twitter. And he said that I revolutionized his life the way he thought, and he allowed me to mentor him in racial reconciliation. And so, like I, I asked with you, how did we first meet? And so he said that I said this. I do not believe I said this. It doesn't sound like me. It sounds a lot harsher than what I would say, but this is what he heard. He said that I said that it's on you white folks to do the work. I don't remember saying it like that. <laughs> but I, I, I have said that in the, in the American space, a lot of times it reminds me of what Zacchaeus, when Zacchaeus saw Jesus, one of the first things he said is, I'll repay what it, whoever I harmed, I will repay. If I Amen. really see Jesus right, and like you said, it may not have been me, it may have been my ancestors, but I'm willing to do the work to repay because I see Jesus right. And so I guess, I, and I still don't think I said it that harsh, <laughs> but he said it mentored him to get out and start actually doing the work. And, I, and one thing I'll say that to help our white brothers and sisters, when, when the George Floyd thing happened, I had eight pastors call me who were white and they wanted to have conversations with me. And it, it, it wasn't Josh or Andrew Draper, who people I normally talk to. It was people that I don't normally have relationship with. And they, they wanted to talk to me, and it was beautiful, but they came with a mindset of just what I call white guilt, which doesn't actually help. Because what they wanted me to do, they wanted me to tell them all my pains, to tell them what is it like to live being black in America. Tell, and sometimes I think, before you come to me and you want to reconcile, how about you do the work to understand it before we talk so I don't have to uncover all these layers. So if, if I'm dealing with someone who's been molested, I want to figure out how to move forward. I don't want to always dig up the pain. And sometimes I feel like when people talk to me, some of our pastors, they just want to know, know like, what's it like for you walking as a black man? I'm like, God. Like, you know, and I'm like, ah, can we? And so like, in, in some questions, I was like, Do you, have you ever heard of redlining? Do you know about this? Like, no, I, 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 don't, I have no idea. That. So sometimes it's good for you to do your own work mm-hmm. so that when you come to reconcile with someone that there's some commonality. 
Like if I'm going to talk to someone in uh, Spain, I want to know something about the Spanish culture before I come over there so that I, I show that I'm really committed to the work. And I love those pastors, but since the George Ford thing, I haven't heard from about seven of them because it was the guilt of the moment. But real, real reconciliation doesn't go with the news cycle. Amen. Amen. Real reconciliation is in the heart. So if there's nothing going on in the news cycle, it's still something about that person. I see Jesus in you. So I want to do life with you because I see Jesus in you or the potential for Jesus to be in you. So I, I would say this is what we all should be. And this is, is Micah. And it, it piggybacks off of what, uh, what you shared. So let's put this up in Micah. I think everybody should be this way. It's so simple, but it's a requirement. So Micah 6 and 8. It says this, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? This is not a suggestion. It's a requirement. But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. One version says to love mercy, mercy justice and mercy. If we all, no matter what race, creed, gender orientation we are, if we focus on Jesus and we are to do justice and love mercy, a lot of this stuff is going to work. It's still going to be hard work, but we're coming from the right frame of reference. I'm ready to love people and offer mercy because at the end of the day, the only reason why I'm saved is because God loved me and he offered me mercy. And that is what we should be doing. And I, I think we all could do better that. It's not just a white versus black thing. I think we all could do better in that. We look, we look after justice. In America, mainly blacks have been injustice, seen injustice. But, but if we look at it all, I think the greatest racism has been the green versus the rest of us. The money versus the rest of us. Really, it's not really the black and white. If you really look at the injustice, it all really came about money. It was, it was money and power. So that's what we all are fighting. We're not really fighting each other. We're fighting the, the demon of mammon. We're fighting the demon of power and pride. And if we can figure that out, we'll realize that we all, we all have been subjected to that. And if we all fought together, wow, what kind of people we would be. So that's, that's, my, that's my take on that. All right, so that, that leads us to, uh, I think, our final question. Question five. And it's a two-part question as well, so you can read them both. As we come to a close, what does fatherhood mean to each of you? Are there any scriptures on fatherhood that jump out to either of you? I believe I believe you're starting this off. First of all, can you tell us how many uh, children you have? Yeah. And I'll tell them how many I have. We've got five kids. Uh, Woo! Yeah, they're right there. They're right there. My wife, Whitney, and our five kids right there, uh, ranging from 11 to three months. Uh, so we're, uh, we're busy. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and speaking of that, um, uh, how this came about, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. But he had sent me an email because uh, he was going to be out with uh, maternity leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wanted me to preach at his church. But somehow it ended up in my spam file, and I never seen it until later. So I reached back out to him, and it was too late. And we were like, well, let's just get together. We're going to do something this year. And so it, it, it came from that. You were trying to invite me back out to preach. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think uh, God reveals himself, right, to us as father. And so I think the most important thing he says to Jesus kind of relates to fatherhood. He says, of Jesus, he says, this is my beloved son mm -hmm. in whom I am well pleased. So I think the goal of fatherhood is to have our children know a picture of the love of God. That you are my beloved child and I am well pleased with you. Wow. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we look at when it comes to fatherhood in the world of, of toughness or providing or discipline or all these things, that all can come, but actually I would say that the scripture passage that I would refer to in this would be actually the one I read earlier in Zephaniah, 
Do our children really know that we love them so much that we would sing over them? Now, my kids don't want me to sing because I can't sing. <laughs> but metaphorically, do I sing over them? Do, do they know and do they experience something that shows them that God is a good father who loves them? And that's, that's the goal. That's the goal of being a father is to, to have our kids know that they are loved. That's, that's, that's powerful. For, for me, I, I'm going to have them uh, flash this something on the screen I thought really speaks, spoke to me of uh, my father as well. But a godly father leaves a godly legacy. I believe it says progenitor, protector, provider, leader, hero. And all those things represented who my father was, my, my bishop, my, my dad, who we, who we lost in October. And, and uh, never, thought, never thought he would be gone this soon, uh, end up getting COVID, and, and it just, things transpired pretty rapidly. And, and it, 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 it was tough to say the least. But the, the last part of that is what really has really gripped me. It says it leaves a legacy. And what keeps me moving forward is I know we lost him, but the legacy he left is so great. And to be able to walk in these shoes. And some of the things that people are doing now, he was doing in the 80s when people thought he was crazy. They said he was a crack addict because he was go down to what they called low end. And he would grab crack addicts, and then when they come up, down off their high, he'd sit and read the scripture to them. He would love people, and, and they talked about him. But now what people are doing now, he was so far ahead of his time, and he left a legacy for me to walk in. And so fatherhood to me is just, it's an honor to be a father. And I have three children, and most of my church knows, so I'll let the City Hope know that it took us eight years to have the three children we had, and we had a total of three miscarriages. And so that process was very difficult. Uh, I was a youth pastor. We were youth pastors, and you would see young people who don't have a marital covenant popping out babies. It didn't seem like we could have uh, babies. It seemed like God was being slow, but when he brought them, he was right on time. And I don't feel right to complain about the same children I cried and begged God for. So I'm grateful for my three children, Draylen, Dylan, and Alana. And other than that, my father taught me that fathering is not just the people that come from your loins. It's those people that God connects you with that you're able to father. I have a, a cousin who uh, I treat her like a daughter, just how, somehow God brought us together in a, in a time of need. And so, so there's, there's a scripture that, I, that I'll have that we will uh, close this portion from and move into our communion. This is a scripture that speaks to me about fatherhood. So let's put 1 Corinthians 4, 14. Uh, Paul is writing this. He says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Verse 15, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. This is a day and age that we have technology, which is great, but anybody can get on and preach and talk. And then we have the celebrity pastors, which I'm not totally against someone having a big congregation, not against that, but we don't have many fathers, many people who would actually father people that actually care. Unfortunately, I don't believe it's the case in City Hope or Deliverance Temple, but unfortunately for some people, you're just a number that comes through the door. You just be able to say to my denomination, we won this many souls, but they don't really care about the people. We, don't have, we have a lot of instructors, but not many fathers. And in order to be a father, that takes work. It takes deep work. And for me, my heart breaks when our people go through things. I preach hard and preach a positive message and the devil will hit our people, and I get calls of what our people are faced with and going through, and it breaks me. And I go to God, and I cry, and I sing over the congregation because I'm a father at heart. That's what my father gave me, to actually father the people. And I believe that you guys have the same type of leader that really care to father you. So on this Father's Day, know that God has given you shepherds after his own heart 
who really care for you. Your successes mean something to us. Your failures mean something to us. Your tears mean something to us. Your joy means something to us. Your smile means something to us because at the end of the day, we're fathers. We may correct, but at the end of the day, we love our flock because of the great shepherd and the great father who loves each one of us, and so we try to share that love with you. Can we, can we put our hands together for that? As we stand, I just feel a sweet spirit just, just over this place. As we stand and we move to our communion. City Hope, they do communion every single Sunday. Uh, we do it once a month, and so it's just beautiful to do it together. Uh, let's... Let's just, let's share each verse as we do it. Look, would you put our first verse up? I'll read this one and I'll have you read the second one. So uh, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. Would you go ahead and would you grab your bread? All right, well, let's put our next verse up for Josh to read. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let's, let's eat the bread. And City Hope, I apologize, because you guys get real bread. We get this styrofoam stuff, but so I apologize for that. I'll read the next verse. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I believe there's one final verse. Josh, as you read that, then would you go ahead and do, do our closing prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, this is your table. Yes. There's few things in this world that show us how near you are to us than this table. Yes, God. As surely as we have eaten of this bread and drank from this cup, we can know that you love us. And as surely as we have eaten this bread and drank this cup, in the presence of one another, we can be that sure that you have bought us to be your family together. So in our communion with you and with one another, God, would you do a powerful work by your spirit? Father, I know you're doing something here. Yes, God. And so would you continue to do it? And Lord, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we want to trust you, Holy Spirit, to do what you're going to do in this place. In Deliverance Temple and in City Hope Fellowship and in our joint communion together as the family of God. You are doing something and building something, and Jesus, would you do it? Yes, God. Lord, today, would we know that you are at work? And Lord, today, would you help us to honor and celebrate fathers well, but Lord, also for those who have difficulty with that? Yes, God. Yes, God. Would you come and fill up what is lacking? Would you be a good father to those who need a father? God, would you help us to know you, to love you, and to know and love one another? Holy Spirit, would you do your work and send us out now to be your people who are called by your name and loved by you so that we would be your hands and feet and love this city so that 
Muncie, Indiana would look different because of this thing yes, God. that you are doing. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to say God bless you all. Much love to you.